So I'm Michael Crenshaw. I'm a software engineer at Intuit on the Argo CD team. Uh, my name is Henrik Flixt. I'm a product manager uh, also at Intuit and one of the uh, Argo maintainers. And you're up. No mouse. There we go. So just uh, uh, quickly, since we're both from Intuit, just want to give you a, a quick introduction to who we are and give you a little bit understanding where we're coming from. So uh, we're a financial technology software company based in the US. We have most of our business in the US. Uh, and we spent the last few years uh, building a platform uh, that comprised of five pillars to modernize our, our infrastructure. So we now have moved all, all our services to this platform. And this platform now serves about 58 billion uh, machine learning predictions per day. Uh, and during uh, tax peak season, which is our you know, main time of year, we push about 3.6 billion requests uh, through this platform. Uh, and if you look at the, the dev environment that we have when, when our teams go in and create a new application to build, to build a service, we, we automatically uh, vend a namespace and a bunch of other things automatically for them for that application. So we have about 16,000 namespaces uh, in, in our environment for the 3,000-ish services that we have running. Um, and these are developed by the 6,000 uh, plus developers that, that we have that work on, on all the services for those, those, those products that, that we have. So th this platform and this journey that we've been on for the last few years has, has given us a six-fold increase in developer uh, productivity. So that's a huge lift uh, and a huge benefit to uh, all our developers. And, and Argo has been one of the key parts, parts of that. We're also strong believers in, in open source. Um, as some of you probably know, uh, Argo, the Argo project came from Intuit originally. And, uh, but we also have other projects. We're also heavily involved in the community in, in other areas like Kubernetes, uh, Istio, we have a new project called Numa Proj that we announced very recently. And we try and, and, and contribute and work with the open source communities, communities as much as we can. And this was also recognized in 2019 when we won the end user award. And for those of you that were in the keynote on Wednesday, we actually won it again um, this, the, this year. So big thank you to the end user community for, for the recognition. We're really happy and proud uh, over that. Uh, but this talk is about Argo, not into it. So just a little quick background uh, for those of you that don't know Argo, which I'm guessing is not too many of you. But uh, one thing you probably don't know is that Argo actually turned five years old uh, last week. We had our, uh, one of our maintainers, Jesse Suen, uh, did the first PR uh, on October 17th, five years ago, which was the birth of Argo. So happy birthday, Argo. Uh, and Argo has four sub-projects, uh, Argo Workflows, Argo CD, Argo Rollouts, and Argo Events. So the most that we're going to talk to uh, today is Argo CD, but a lot of it covers uh, the, the other projects as well. We have hundreds of, there are hundreds of companies using Argo in production today. And I'm sure some of you here use it in production as well. And over the years, we've, we've, we've had over 7,000 people that have contributed to the Argo project. And we're growing with with, all, with somewhere between 30 and 50 new contributors uh, every week. So it's a pretty amazing growth. And, and all these contributors and, and all these companies have actually also propelled Argo to be one of the, the fastest growing, highest velocity projects within, within C and CF. But so how did it start? So where, where did our security journey start and why did we get interested in, in security? So Argo started as an incubating project uh, about two and a half years ago now. Uh, and in February in 2021, roughly a year and a half ago, now we applied for graduation. So as part of the incubation and graduation process, there's this focus on security. You have to go through a security assessment. Uh, the TOC was involved. You have some sponsors that help you, you know, guide you through what's needed to be a mature project. Uh, so that kind of helped us increase the security focus of the project. And we, we, at that point, we didn't really know what we didn't know. And that's kind of what this talk is going to highlight, like all the things that we learned along the way. Because we, because back then we kind of thought we were really good at security. We hadn't really had any CVEs. And if you don't have any CVEs, you must have good security, right? Um, 
we also thought there were a lot of maintainers in Argo that really knew security. So we thought, you know, we know security, we're good at security. But it was very siloed. We didn't really share that knowledge. So there were a few people that knew some things very good, and there were some others that didn't really know anything. We didn't really know who knew what. Uh, and also, we looked at, like, oh, we've, we've done A, we've done B, we've done C, our security is good. And, and without really realizing the security is something that evolves as the attack vectors change, as new threats come out, you know, you add new code, whatever. The security needs to change as well, and new technologies, new tools that come out. So it's something that has to be a process. So as we were going through this, um, we also had a new experience with our first day's uh, zero CV. We, we, we had a couple of CVs before this one, but this was the first one where a security vendor reported a, a CV. So uh, just want to stress that we worked really well with this vendor. It was an awesome vendor. And we worked together with them hand in hand, you know, with the, the embargo for the, for the issue. Uh, we wrote the patch. We talked to them about, you know, when they were going to release this information. And it was a 7.7 .7 CV, so it wasn't, you know, super high. It was, it was still seen as a high, but it's not, it's nothing crazy, right? So we figured, you know, we're, we're, we're doing good, right? We'll talk to the vendors, we have a patch. Um, the embargo lifted, and this is kind of what I wake up to the next morning. Because um, what we didn't realize and what we hadn't really talked about was that this vendor didn't just fix this or report this CV or help us with this to be, to be nice to us, right? They had a vested interest in this, so they want to make sure that they um, got some benefit out of this. So they went massive media-wise in terms of they, like, every single media outlet you can think of had an article about, about Argo and this security issue. So the good news is, you know, we... we you know, CNCF measures, you know, the number of uh, media mentions. So, you know, Argo had, you know, more than the, the next three together. Um, so, you know, all PR is, is good PR, right? Um, so, this, so this was also an interesting uh, learning uh, experience, right? Because we, need, we, need, we figured out, you know, we need to communicate better. And not just within the group of maintainers, but also with the people outside of the, the group of maintainers you work with. You know, had, had we talked more to the vendor and kind of figure out what their intentions were, I mean, they, they were good. I mean, they were doing this and it's part of the business they're doing it, but we just saw it as it's a CV for the project. We need to fix the code. And we didn't really realize that, hey, there's some wider implications of working with the security vendor on this. Uh, and we didn't really have the processes in place either. Like, we knew how to fix the code, but this whole part of the, the PR marketing collateral, working with external vendors and all that, just wasn't, wasn't really there yet. And we had it for the code, but not for anything else. And then the last insight is like, it's not as sinister as it sounds. And trust no, trust no one, but figure out what their intentions are. When, why, why are you working with them? What's their end goal? What the benef what's the benefits they're looking to get out of it, right? Had we had to spend a little bit more time on that, and talked a bit more to the vendor, we could have figured out, hey, this is, they're going to do this massive media campaign, so we should probably you know, have some response to that as well instead of being bombarded with Slack messages and emails the next morning saying, like, what the heck is going on here, right? So, so I think that's really, I mean, all of us engineers are really focused on just fixing that code issue, but a project is bigger than that, right? So we need to figure out how to do these, these other things. So, so, so some of the things we started doing then we, with this newfound knowledge was we started replacing some of the siloed knowledge that we had with more structured information. So we started documenting these processes, starting do, started documenting what should happen when there is a CV. And Michael will go into more details about that later. But figuring out you know, who knows what and in what order do we do things. So this also helped helps us you know, figure out what processes should be in place and you know, what, what steps that need to be taken. Um, and then also, you know, working together with the TSC and the security tag, we also looked at some other tools that could be incorporated in, into this process. And, <clears throat> and then lastly, we want to make sure that it is security, so we can't really talk about everything right as they show up, right? Because you need to make sure there's some embargo. But you also make sure that there's enough transparency that it doesn't look like we're we're hiding something, right? So it's like figuring out that balance between 
transparency in, in the embargo and in folding that back into the processes and documentation that we were doing. Yeah, so um, the, the first thing that happened when we got the notification about the new CVE, the new zero day, uh, was it came via email. And then immediately a few of the core maintainers opened up uh, DMs in CNCF Slack. And they're talking about, well, how severe is this? Who knows how to fix it? Um, and that slowly turned into a temporary private Slack channel. Uh, where just the, the people who were necessary to the resolution process um, were there to talk about it. So the first thing they needed to do is discuss how are we going to respond to this vendor, because that's on an email thread. Uh, so they coordinated um, what information do we need from them, what information do they need from us so that they get proper credit for this vulnerability, uh, et cetera. So that was all done on this private Slack channel. Um, the next thing that happened was they workshopped the fix. So. Uh, we found the person who is the most familiar with the code that was vulnerable uh, and got them in a discussion with initially how we're going to put together the patch. And then finally, that channel became the place where we coordinated releasing the patches uh, across all of our currently supported versions. And Argo CD supports the three most recent minor versions. That Slack channel, we quickly realized, wasn't simply going to be a temporary place to talk. Uh, this wasn't going to be the last CVE that we faced. Um, and we needed to make it permanent. So we created a new permanent private Slack channel, uh, and that became the basis for our new special interest group for security. And now having this special interest group gave us a few advantages. Um, the first thing was we established a group of people who had need to know about new vulnerabilities as they came in. Uh, so people who had some trust relationship with the project, mostly by having been a maintainer for a while, and typically some interest in security. It also gave us a place to discuss when and how we could expand the need to know, um, because there have been vulnerabilities where not, the people in that group don't necessarily have all the expertise they need to evaluate it and then communicate to our users uh, about that vulnerability. So that channel gave us a place to say, okay, I, I want to bring in this other expert. Are you all cool with that? Um, do we have a good trust relationship with them for an individual uh, vulnerability? Second thing this gave us was the ability to handle the embargo process. So a lot of um, companies use Argo products as the basis for their paid products. And those folks don't want their customers waking up and reading about a vulnerability and saying, oh no, we're vulnerable to this as well. Uh, they want to be able to say, we've already patched that um, and you're safe. So this gave us a place to make sure that all the vendors got the patches in time and had them released before the open source project released um, the vulnerabilities to the public. That embargo process um, for the moment has just sort of de facto been limited to the folks who are in that security interest group initially, so early maintainers, et cetera. Uh, and we realize that over time, there are going to be vendors who aren't part of special interest group security, they, um, but they do have products that they want early notification for bugs with. So we're going to have to set up a process where we can establish a trust relationship with vendors and make sure they get patches um, ahead of time in order to get their products patched. Uh, that's still to be done, um, but we have good examples from other projects that we can follow. Uh, so this special interest group also gave us the opportunity to reflect on things that were missed. Um, in the four months after that first zero day dropped, we handled a total of 15 CVEs across the uh, four Argo projects. And a lot of that was because we just started looking. The maintainers thought, okay, well, if this was vulnerable, maybe there's something similar to that that's vulnerable. Um, and in parallel to that, while we were going through the graduation process, uh, an organization was uh, sponsored by the CNCF to audit all of the Argo projects. And they identified, I think, between six and seven CVEs all about the same time. So the workload became very heavy very quickly. And at some points, we had as many as six vulnerabilities that we were actively trying to understand, uh, patch, embargo, release, all at the same time. And that's a lot of work, and it makes it really easy to miss steps. 
One of the things that uh, is easy to miss is we have an email channel. That's how people tell us about vulnerabilities. Um, and when uh, our security special interest group wants to communicate with them, there are several people who see that email. And they might all at once say, okay, we're gonna respond to the security vendor and discuss the vulnerability. If people don't communicate among each other, the vendor can get frustrated if they start getting mixed messages uh, or inconsistent communication with our project. Um, so over time, we've learned to use particularly the Slack channel uh, to coordinate that messaging. Second, um, reviews of security advisories and patches get delayed. So this isn't just one patch for CVE. When uh, a CVE happens for Argo CD, for example, we don't just patch the most recent version, we patch the most recent three versions. And sometimes that cherry pick isn't clean. The patch is a little bit different. So that's 18 patches that need to be reviewed. And then you have a security advisory for each one, which is just text, and that's sometimes really in depth. Um, and you need someone to review that and iterate it. So when you have these many things being reviewed and iterated all at once, it can be really difficult for people to remember well, what the heck work is still in flight. So things get dropped and things get delayed. And finally, um, and this one was on me, we had a vendor who needed to know about a patch and get their product patched for their customers. And I was so busy you know, pushing out the patches as quickly as I could that a patch went out and a GitHub security advisory was released before they were ready and it, it caused problems for them internally. Um, so we needed to find ways to avoid that happening in the future. And the way we did that was we started formalizing and documenting the process that we had learned sort of in a trial by fire. Um, first, we created a GitHub repository and it's private and it contains two files, a readme briefly saying what it is and a GitHub issue template. And that GitHub issue template is an extremely detailed list of all the steps that need to be taken for every CVE that gets reported to us, from the moment we hear about it to when the embargo is finally lifted and all the patches are released. One of my favorite parts of this list is very near the top, and it is we have to write a security advisory draft. And this is extremely important uh, to be early because when you write a security advisory, you start investigating the standard things that go into one, what versions were affected. So you go back to the code and read it and understand why was this feature or this, this bug introduced in the first place because your patch is gonna be informed by why does this code even exist. Uh, another thing that it does is it causes you to think from the attacker's perspective because when you write a security advisory, you're describing how to perform the attack so that your users know this is what we're defending against. When you write it that way, you understand potentially different ways that you could perform an attack that weren't immediately apparent. And it became obvious that this step needed to be early one time when we had a CVE. We quickly wrote a patch, like within hours of hearing about the issue. But when we went and wrote the security advisory, we realized there was a different avenue to perform the same attack that we hadn't addressed. Um, so if, you're, if you end up writing a checklist like this for your own project, your own uh, organization, I recommend security advisory draft goes really early. Uh, and finally, part of the process that we introduced was um, just having meetings with this new special interest group. Um, when you have that much flight in work, even if you have uh, lists in GitHub, people sometimes lose track of what they're actively working on. So at first, when we were dealing with you know, the four months of 15 CVEs, we would meet once a week just to touch base and make sure everyone was on track. Uh, and over time, we've, we've been able to expand that to every two weeks, and that's worked very well for us. Something else that came out of um, all of this, this process of dealing with these CVEs was we found some patterns. Uh, one of the issues that we continued to encounter again and again for five CVEs was our repo server component was vulnerable to um, directory traversal and symlink following attacks. And without going into you know, unnecessary detail about what the repo server is, basically what it does is it goes to Git or Helm, gets manifests that uh, are to be deployed to Kubernetes, and then it compiles them using Helm, Customize, etc. 
Then the application controller picks up those manifests, put them, puts them on the Kubernetes as resources. If you have multiple tenants using a single Argo CD instance, or even multiple users, and you don't have a full trust relationship between them, you want to make sure that one um, repository owner can't write their code in a way that traverses out and reaches someone else's manifests. Because it might have secrets in it or just sensitive information that you don't want those folks to have. So that's the repo server. Um, with five CVEs related to directory traversal and symlink following, we started to lock things very heavily down. First, permissions go to zero when the on-disk cache of the repository is not actively being used. Second, we use ephemeral copies of manifests for um, user-contributed or user-written plugins. So that plugin gets a copy of the manifests, does everything that it needs to do, and then we delete that. Uh, it, there's no way to traverse to it because it doesn't exist anymore. Then we started using cryptographically secure um, UIDs for the cache paths because previously they had been deterministic. They were based on the repository URL. Uh, so we randomized them. If you can't guess the path, then you can't traverse to it and you can't write a symlink that goes to it. Uh, and then finally, symlinks gave us such fits, we decided just to kill them if they reached outside of the repository at any point in sort of the chain of the symlink then we just reject that repository and say, sorry, you've got to change your, um, change your repository to get rid of that. Second secure coding practice we picked up was as part of the, the security audit that happens, there were some issues in, actually I believe, workflows uh, where the cryptography was not secure enough. There wasn't sufficient entropy for the purpose um, that it was being used for. So we did a good full audit of um, all the cryptography we were using in Argo CD, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and discovered some more places where we had insufficient entropy or we were not using a cryptographically secure, excuse me, <coughs> I'm back with you. We were not using a cryptographically secure random number generator in places where we should. Uh, so we issued CVEs for those where it was appropriate and then just in other places where it wasn't as sensitive, we just fixed the issue. Finally, and I think this is pretty huge for our users, uh, we started improving our logging. A lot of events that happen in Argo CD are related to security, but they don't necessarily mean that someone's attacking you. For example, there were places where, you know, Go can throw an error when you try to close a file. And by itself, if you fail to close a file, that's not an issue. If it happens hundreds and thousands of times, it can be an issue and cause a denial of service. So we have introduced to our structured logging a new field called security. And if that field is present and it has a number sort of designating the severity from one to five, um, you know that this event just needs an extra look uh, in terms of um, it, it may indicate an attack underway or a potential issue in the future. Uh, so that'll help our users monitor Argo CD for upcoming issues. We've also tightened up our um, supply chain security. So we've introduced SBOMs to all of the projects, uh, which is just a, a digest of all the dependencies that are included in our CLIs and our images. Um, it also provides a snapshot of releases. So we use Ubuntu base images and dependencies aren't pinned. Uh, each release may get a new version of a package. This gives us the ability to go back to a release and see precisely what was installed at the time of that release. Um, and it also just gives people the ability to scan a release and say, does this fit our threat profile for our environment? Can we install this software? Something that's new as of a couple weeks ago, as part of the security slam, um, we started signing both of our, both our images and our CLI binaries. So if you go to the GitHub repo and look at the latest Argo CD release, you'll see a .sig file and we sign, um, sign the binary. So if you use one of our binaries or use one of our images, you can verify on your side, is the thing I'm about to run the thing that the Argo CD team says that they built? And a final um, engineering best practice we introduced, and actually this was really thanks to CNCF, uh, we started doing some fuzzing. So the same folks who did the audit of all the Argo projects wrote about 40 fuzzers for us. Um, and those already 
showed uh, a lot of promise and paid dividends because they discovered a CVE in Argo CD. Sorry, Argo Events is where they discovered the CVE um, with a fuzzer, and that was resolved. And they also used a fuzzer to demonstrate a bug in Argo CD just by, you know, they wrote the code and said, uh, we ran this, and this shows you how you can attack Argo CD. They also used it to demonstrate that we had resolved the problem afterwards. Um, yeah, so those are the engineering practices that we put in place. Henrik has more on process. Thank you, Michael. So some of the, uh, so show of hands, how many in here are uh, contributors to one or more projects? A few, a few hands in here. So, so both CNCF and the, the open source community as a whole actually have a lot of resources and give us a lot of opportunity um, to, get, to get help and funding to, to improve our security. So one, one of the organizations that helped us a lot was uh, OSTIF, the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund. So they're a security uh, featured uh, or security focused fund that helps open source project to improve the security. So they, they help with funding, they help go through the RFPs, uh, and, they, and they basically set up and helped us get funding and set up the, the, the late, latest assess, security assessment we did with one of the external uh, auditors. So big thank you to, to Austin for helping out with that. Um, another big help was the security tag, the CNCF security tag. There's a number of security focused volunteers that, that help CNCF projects improve their security as well. So they have a couple of different programs. There's a security pal or security buddy that can step in and, and help your CNCF project with give you some ideas on areas to look at. Um, they also have a longer process with a security assessment. So we're right now wrapping up our joint assessment with a security tag. So there's another venue for, for any of the CNCF projects, you know, whether you're sandbox, incubated, or graduated, <clears throat> you have the opportunity to go through and do this, this joint assessment with a security tag. Uh, we have OSSS Fuzz that, that Michael already mentioned. Uh, if you're an open source project, you can get, get your fuzzers written uh, and they can run in, in this uh, cloud environment. Uh, if, and if you're, if you're a vendor with a paid for project, you can still use the libraries that they provide, but you, know, you would have to run, run the, the fuzzers yourself. Uh, and the last but not least is the IBB, the Internet uh, Bug Bounty Program. So that's similar to the other organizations that it's, it's, a, it's a grouping of, of, of donors, uh, generous companies that uh, pool money and IBB helps to, to pool and distribute these money. So basically what they do is they do payouts to, uh, to people that find CVEs and security issues in the projects that are signed up for it. So going through all this that Michael and I have talked to now, we feel more than secure in where we are with Argos. We have signed up for this. So anyone who now finds a CVE in Argo can actually submit that to us and we'll help you work through in actually getting some, uh, some good money from the IBB as a thank you for finding that uh, CVE. So just a, a few quick words here to wrap things up. I know we talked about, <clears throat> it's been talked about earlier this week that open source projects are not products. Uh, and I know that's a distinction we want to make, but you should treat your project as a product. Um, like, like I mentioned earlier, we're really good at writing code, but a lot of open source projects are, don't really take into account like all the other things that go into building a good product and all the processes. You know, like, I think most of us have seen one or more open source projects that might be a little bit lacking on the documentation side, for example, or things like that. So it's, marketing and PR is generally non-existent. It's usually even worse than documentation. So there's, there are a lot of these things that, that go into building a great product that are missing from a lot of open source projects. And that's something that you, know, you should really take to heart. And there are a lot of roles and responsibilities that all product teams have that are not simply there in most open source projects. Same goes for processes. Like I said, when we talked about you know, how we handle the CVE, most companies that have been around for a while, they have those ingrained in them. They have, they've been through this before. A lot of open source projects that start from scratch, they might not have thought about this. It might not be seen as an important thing to do, right? So, so that's something to think about as well. And then, and then lastly, like an open source project is used as a product by many vendors. There are a lot of companies that use open source projects as critical parts of their infrastructure. So security for an open source project should not be treated any differently 
than any other product, product that, or project that is used in your, in your environment. Definitely take advantage of the community resources that, that are available. Um, you know, we all pay membership fees to CNCF, so taking advantage of getting some of that money back. Use the resources that are available. Uh, there are a lot of really good resources you can use, both with CNCF for the security tag, I mentioned OSTIF, IBB. Uh, if you're part of an open source project, reach out to these organizations. They're super helpful, and they have a lot of really good resources to help um, projects in, in, increase their security. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, is help us help you. Help, help us make Argo better. Um, and there's no really better way of, of doing that by testing and breaking things. So, you know, if there's a release candidate that comes out, you know, put it in a sandbox, try and break it. Uh, and now try, you can try and, try and hack it. And you, we will actually pay you for that. So you can sign up and participate in the Bug Bounty program either as a project or as an individual, submit the CVE, and um, it's, it's actually, uh, I can't remember the exact amount, but it's actually a fair amount of money that would, if you find a high or critical severity CVE that would get paid out to you. Um, and for those of you that are part of projects, it's actually something in it for you as project as well, because part of that bounty actually goes back to the project as well. So the, the project actually get, um, get a little bit of money to help uh, fund additional security work in the project. And then uh, on Friday, <clears throat> which is tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., uh, Argo participates in the ContribFest. We'll have maintainers there. So those of you that uh, are now interested in breaking Argo, we will help you get started, help you get Argo installed, and you can start uh, learning more about Argo and, and hacking away at Argo. And I think with that, please remember to uh, submit your feedback after the session. And I think we also have a few minutes left for questions, if you have anything here. We'll also be uh, at the event later tonight. Happy to talk over a beer or two. Just wave at me if you have any questions. And I'll come get you. Is there going to be an accelerated way as far as, you know, because CVE is going to take a while to be authorized, be established, and even be you know, created from, from that CVE board. Is there a way to accelerate the process when we find vulnerabilities on a platform like Argo? Uh, the process in terms of getting the patch out or, or what, what would need yeah, to be accelerated? Well, a vulnerability doesn't have to be just an established CVE, right? Sure. I mean, they have their, obviously, it's there long before someone gives it a number. And so I guess that was my thing. Is, is there a way to directly interact with Argo so that we can find vulnerabilities and get them to to Argo and the developers before we have to wait for a CVE number to be established. Sure, so it, there are a few ways to just um, at least discuss Argo CD security. I mean, we've got the Argo CD Slack channel where I'm, I'm always monitoring it. Our security interested folks are monitoring it. So if you just have questions and you're like trying to poke holes in Argo and please do, then people will answer there. We also have the bi-weekly SIG security meeting, which is typically open. We, we only have closed sessions if we need to talk about a CVE. Um, and you can just show up, and we're happy to, to chat about it. And, and, and if, you think, if you think there is a CVE and if there's a security vulnerability, then maybe not you know, blast it out <laughs> on Slack. Uh, th there, is, there is an email address that we, that we talked about. There is a process for reporting CVEs. So if you think it might be a security vulnerability, you can send use that email address, and it will go to you know, to, the, to our SIG security group and we can deal with it the way it should. If it's not a CVE, you know, we, we'll still have to discuss it with you, but if it is a CVE, you know, then try and keep it to the, to the process. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. All right, we may have time for one more question, if anyone has any. All right, if not, thank you very much and thank you to our speakers. <laughs>